Welcome to this new episode of The Context. Today I am going to talk to you about immune systems of organisms and organizations. An immune system, if you think about it, is really the dynamic boundary of a metabolism that defines itself versus the universe. Everything that is not you is identified by your immune system as an enemy to keep in check at least, but very possibly uh, to fight against. And when immune systems work well, they are wonderful and uh, they are, of course, essential to maintain our bodies healthy, uh, to make sure that we can do what we need to do uh, while we are immersed in a world that is definitely rich of others. And while we are doing that, our immune system constantly adapts, uh, receives new kinds of uh, stimulations, and uh, it feels out uh, what are uh, the boundaries of its own adaptability. This uh, desire to defend and to act goes into hyperdrive in autoimmune diseases. When the immune system uh, turns around and attacks the host organism, these autoimmune diseases are not fully understood yet, but certainly they will be a very important uh, area of development in uh, uh, re medical research and in understanding how to keep ourselves healthy uh, in the future as well. So, is it a useful transposition to draw an analogy from organisms to organizations and to check whether organizations have immune systems as well, and how do they behave, whether they exhibit heightened or weakened immune reactions, uh, whether they have something equivalent to autoimmune diseases as well. So let's start from uh, the organization's ability to affirm themselves. Certainly, an organization that survives is successful. And we can say that uh, the identity itself of an organization derives from its success, as it is recognized by itself and by others. And this certainty in its modus operandi, uh, in its uh, way of doing things, generates strength in recognizing its, its identity. And this power needs to be deployed. That is the driving force of the growth of organizations that are, in a certain way, constantly unbalanced. They are always seeking to go further. They are never content in being in a state of equilibrium, in a state of, of stasis. Now, in these episodes of uh, the context, we frequently talk about the rapidly changing environments and why they are so challenging and how the stimulation and, and the challenges and the competition um, uh, that that is... Uh, facing the organizations is coming from many different directions simultaneously. And that uh, very often these different directions, these different attacks interact themselves, analyzing completely and acting on these is uh, impossible. Today's world is not a world where uh, Soviet-style five-year plans are useful. 
I can tell you, having been uh, born and, and having grown up uh, until I was 14 in a centrally planned economy, those five-year plans didn't work even 30, 40 years ago. Um, and, and probably they, they never really worked because they are blind and deaf uh, to the uh, feedback mechanisms that adaptable organizations need in order to be able to keep being fit. Now, the opportunity to grow the organizations is a necessity if you want to deploy the resources. And the deployment of these resources should make the organizations ever more successful. This should imply that very successful organizations have a higher likelihood of being successful too in the future. Turns out this is not the case. It looks like uh, as if the larger the resources that you can deploy in order to be successful does nothing but increase the challenges that you will select and want to be facing, as well as it will increase the uh, mistakes that, as a consequence, you will make. There is an empirical statistical proof of this uh, that uh, we often cite, I often cite in my conferences, and it is how the uh, um, getting into the standard and poor 500 list of uh, largest companies used to be a measure of your success that lasted more than 50 years. Once you got in, at the beginning of the 20th century, 100 years ago, you would stay in that index, statistically speaking, for over 60 years. But today, the same result gives you relative peace of mind, the knowledge that given that you were successful, you will be successful for little more than 10 years. This means that this application of strength and power and resources and challenges doesn't necessarily provide the stability of the identity of the organization that if you want that to survive, you should be seeking. Now, the economy is a chaotic system, and we may need a separate episode of the context to talk about the nature of chaotic systems and how, even in the presence of very precise formal descriptions of chaotic systems, their future state cannot be predicted. They develop in, in a manner that necessarily leads to uncertainty around their future state, let alone in a system where even the current state is uncertain. So it is really not a question of more knowledge. We cannot eliminate this uncertainty under more knowledge or consequence of, of more knowledge. So if this uncertainty is intrinsic in how the economy works, what we need to do is to adapt to it. And we have to certainly take on risks that will represent various kinds of desirable experiments where we know that we cannot anticipate the outcome of those experiments. We won't be able to know whether they will be successful beforehand. 
we can learn from the outcome. If the experiment is unsuccessful, we can ask ourselves why and then apply that learning to future experiments, which will be uncertain nonetheless. As well as, we can apply a statistical analysis to a certain group of experiments to see whether we are introducing reasons for failure that can be and should be eliminated. But any individual experiment, its outcome will be still unknown. Now, if an organization doesn't understand the role of uncertainty, the necessity of risk-taking, the um, unknown outcome of the experiments that will be taken, then everything that is done around those areas will be seen by the organization as a threat to its own identity, to its own stability. And the components of that successful organization will turn against what has been identified as a threat, and it will try to eliminate it. The immune system of the organization will attack that activity, the division, those managers, those employees who dare to question the status quo that generated success. Let me give you a few examples of how this actually works in practice. And these are all um, the reactions that we have already seen of changes that, in my view, are unstoppable of various kinds of regulators that wanted to maintain the socioeconomic organization within certain parameters. And you can find some other talks that I gave about the um, network society and how the socioeconomic phase transformation that we are seeing towards decentralization is unstoppable. These examples come from that area, and I hope you will find them illuminating. So, I strongly believe in solar energy, especially in the power of solar photovoltaics to change the world, to improve, to become ever more affordable, more performant, both because of how the various uh, chemical components and the um, processing systems that we use in order to create the solar panels improve, but also because of the so-called uh, industrial learning curve, our ability to produce things at scale at an ever-decreasing cost. And indeed, that has been the case. The cost of solar panels dramatically decreased in the past 30 years, to the point where today they represent in an increasing number of geographical areas the cheapest source of electric power. In some places, the regulations still need to catch up. For example, the regulators believe that solar energy, if let uh, to blossom unchecked, can be detrimental to the stability of the electric grid. So they require the people who install solar panels to connect to the grid in order to feed the grid the electricity they produce and buy from the grid the electricity they consume and let the grid operator balance uh, supply and demand through traditional means. Except that in those places where solar energy becomes extremely popular, the grid operator cannot take all the electricity that is being produced by the solar panels in peak hours. That is exactly what happened in Hawaii a few years ago. And the answer of the regulator 
quite absurdly was to stop the installation of solar panels in the island. It took them almost a year of being the laughing stock of renewable energy proponents and also of more enlightened electric grid operators until they understood that the rules needed to be updated and installations could restart without the obligation of connecting it to the grid that couldn't take it anymore. And finally, the power of electric producers at home to consume the electricity directly themselves. And of course, in the last few years, we have seen similarly dramatic decreases in the price of batteries as well. So we are really at a point where we can create electricity, store electricity, consume electricity in a single house or community, and then go on and connect these cells, these individual producer and consumer cells, in order to create a completely new electric grid topology, a new smart grid, which more and more uh, operators and regulators understand is going to be the future of electricity. The second example is um, in the world of crypto regulations, where an extremely successful location like New York, which has been the uh, real center of the financial world for a century, was tasked to develop new regulations for businesses that wanted to handle cryptocurrencies. And it took them two years to come up with the regulations. And when they were enacted, it turned out that they were immensely cumbersome. So cumbersome that if at the same time you would want it to start a traditional financial institution like a licensed bank and to start a financial institution that did similar things but based on cryptocurrencies, the first would be way cheaper. And the direct consequence of this is that a lot of startups left New York to the point where if your browser was based in New York location-wise uh, uh, and, and the geolocation features of the web server recognized it, you wouldn't be able even to connect to the web servers of those crypto startups that didn't want to have anything to do with New York, not only not having their headquarters there, but not even serving the residents of the state. And it is still very much like that. New York is still kind of in the rear guard of the crypto revolution as compared to many locations in Asia or, or even Europe. The third example is DNA sequencing. When Martin Luther affixed his thesis um, on the church with many, many demands to the Catholic Pope, among which the ability and freedom to translate the Bible and allow anybody to read the sacred text of the word of God, his actions led to centuries of religious wars between the Catholic states and the Protestant states in Europe. And when 23andMe, the 
California company offering gene sequencing services to consumers directly started operating. The FDA, like the Catholic Church, decided it shouldn't be done. You were not entitled to read the sacred text of your DNA directly. You should have and you would have had to go to the priesthood of participants in the medical profession who were the only ones entitled to get access to that knowledge. You were too stupid, too untrustworthy, and certainly for your own benefit, it would be so much better to keep you in ignorance. And the FDA won, and a lot of the gene sequencing and the DNA sequencing services are now kind of emasculated. They completely withdrew from the more edgy and, and more controversial areas of trying to detect um, states of, of, of illness or increased probability to develop an illness based on some kind of genetic basis. And uh, they are now offering services to find your father relatives or to map uh, the geographical location of your ancestors or to voluntarily participate in uh, medical and pharmaceutical research where by answering certain uh, questionnaires you are allowing them to pool your genetic data anonymously together with other people in order to find out what kind of correlations are possible. So, I believe that the organizations that can keep their immune systems in check, whether we are talking uh, in the energy industry, in the financial industry, in the medical industry, or elsewhere, are going to be the ones that execute healthier experiments in larger numbers that are more rapidly able to measure the outcomes of those experiments and improve the likelihood of success by investing in the more successful ones. I believe that success should not breed hubris where regulators pretend that they have the answers in a state of uncertainty where it is natural for nobody to have the answers. Success should enable somebody to get off the pedestal, to admit that they share the inability to provide final answers with everybody else, whether they have been elected or appointed, and that the answers are a guidance to the next step and the next phase when those answers must be re-evaluated and must be found improvable for sure. An important consequence is that regulations should always have sunsetting clauses so that they automatically expire and the regulators as well as all the other stakeholders that participate in the process are forced to confront each other and to ask how the regulations that are now expired can and should be improved. That is just one of many ways. Another important way for experimentation to uh, healthily develop is to adopt uh, what uh, was the very successful creation of the Skunk Works laboratories. The Skunk Works were born so that the 
uh, more out there, the crazier designs for the U.S. Air Force could be tested without the established knowledge of how um, jet fighters or bombers should be designed would stop that kind of necessary crazy kind of experimentation. And Skunk Works has been very successful. They were able uh, to come up with uh, extremely successful uh, designs. And so now we are talking about the Skunk Works approach when a successful organization isolates and empowers those that must experiment so that the immune system of the main organization doesn't kill them. Thank you very much for listening to this episode of The Context. Uh, I will be traveling again. You know that whenever you see this background, uh, uh, I'm in my house. And when you see another background, I'm on the road. Uh, I will be going to the micronation of Andorra. It uh, feels like it's almost a theme developing. Uh, I will have uh, meetings uh, to understand how Andorra can healthily develop uh, in this future that is rushing towards all of us. And I hope I will be able to record some interesting uh, thoughts for you and all of us for the next few episodes of the context uh, there as well. See you soon.